Yo, Justin, you hungry? Do you want to grab some lunch? Uh, yeah, I, I'm hungry, but I've got to tend the neurons. I'm not gonna have a lot of time. Don't worry, I got you. Quick, Jonah, grab the case! Single use instant hot dog. Of all of the silly sentences we've said on this channel, this one might be my favorite. This, like many of our projects, started as a meme, but when we started talking about it, we realized it would probably be fairly easy to implement, and before we knew it, we were specking out materials for an instant hot dog cooker, and a military grade one at that. Now, right off the bat, there were some choices to make, because cooked can mean a lot of things. Hot dogs actually come pre-cooked from the factory, so while it may not be the best way, you can eat them straight out of the package. But in general, if you go to a hot dog stand on the street, those dogs are either boiled or grilled. We consider doing both, but what started as a silly idea turned into more than a month-long research project to actually make the first version work. Remember, we do things not because they are easy, but because we think they'll be easy. So today, we're going with boiled, but let us know in the comments if you'd like to see a grilled version in the future. Initially, we did do some experiments to see if it was possible to cook a hot dog from the inside, but when we tried inserting a tube into a hot dog and then jamming a sparkler down the hole as a sort of slow form of thermite, all we got was a slightly warm hot dog and an absolutely charred core. So we knew it would have to be cooked exclusively from the outside, because if we're doing this incredibly silly project, I won't settle for anything less than a perfectly cooked hot dog. Mm. That's right, Fink. Look at those steaming weenies. Since we're going with boiling our weenies, we needed a way to rapidly heat water to as close as boiling as possible. We ended up taking inspiration from this now discontinued product that makes a hot cup of coffee using a charge of thermite built into the can. The idea was that you twist the bottom, which sets off the chemical reaction and generates a huge amount of heat very quickly to warm the coffee. For those of you unfamiliar, classical thermite is a highly exothermic mixture of aluminum powder and iron oxide. The aluminum acts as the fuel and rips the oxygen off of the iron oxide, leaving behind molten iron as the mixture burns. Beyond just being set off in flower pots on YouTube, thermite has a variety of industrial applications, including welding train tracks together or anything else where you need a ton of molten iron very quickly. But what we found when we looked into it was that the coffee cans use a weird proprietary thermite that the company had developed, and isn't the usual aluminum and iron oxide stuff. While iron oxide and aluminum is the classic recipe, there's lots of ways to make thermite that replace either the type of oxide used or the metal, and depending on your choice, the reaction will be more or less violent. Silicon dioxide, for example, also known as sand, quartz, or just silica, burns much slower and releases less energy than iron oxide, though also at the cost of being harder to start and maintain the burn. You can see that even with the help of some magnesium ribbon, getting silica thermite to burn on its own is very difficult. While it technically releases enough energy to be self-sustaining, you usually need to add another ingredient like sulfur to keep the reaction burning hot enough. The problem with this is adding ingredients like sulfur will produce an enormous amount of gas. So if we want to contain the thermite even a little bit inside of a canister, this is a recipe for very, very bad situations. The coffee cans use some sort of silica thermite, but beyond that, we don't know what other ingredients they added to control the reaction and make it easy enough to start. So we had to just start from scratch and develop our own. We started with normal iron thermite as our control. This sort of thermite has a bunch of characteristic properties. For one, it tends to spray a ton of stuff everywhere and make a huge mess. But beyond that, something I don't think most videos of it make clear is just how bright these reactions are. We had welding masks on to protect our eyes, and even after the reaction, the puddle of molten slag and iron it leaves behind is so bright that it hurts to look at with your bare eyes. Keep in mind, classical thermite burns at temperatures well over 3,000 degrees Celsius. Some of the hottest types of thermite can get even hotter by a few thousand degrees, to the point that they throw off an enormous amount of UV light, enough to get to tan just from being near it during that initial burst of light. 
So it should be said not to try anything you're about to see at home. Thermite is extremely dangerous, and not only can it burn you, but blind you as well. We're doing these tests in a controlled environment with trained professionals and an abundance of safety equipment at the ready. To help show just how bright we're talking about, here's one where I've used as much neutral density and ISO reduction and all that kind of stuff as I could to try and show the reaction while it's at its peak. You can now only just barely see the sparkler that we're using to ignite it, but when the reaction starts, the camera still just gets absolutely maxed out. Slowing the footage down though, you can see that it burns like the sun and the room becomes clearly visible for a moment even through all that darkness. Okay, now let's see what all of this energy can do when we use it to heat water. We set a charge of thermite inside of a sort of test tube that we made out of copper pipe, and then set that in a beaker of water with a thermocouple. As before, it sprays a ton of stuff everywhere, leaving the water tinged a little bit red. And sometimes it would just melt through the copper because the heat wasn't getting conducted away quickly enough. So even though the reaction is really hot, it doesn't do a great job heating the water because of how much material gets ejected and wasted. But you can see the water does boil for a moment, and the water does jump about 50 degrees. So obviously, we're going to need to tame this mixture a little bit if we want to be setting it off inside a partially sealed tube. There will be a vent hole in the hot dog cooker, but too much gas and it could still burst the tube. And we also don't want hot bits of iron flying out the vent either. So anything we add to the thermite has to slow the reaction without cooling it off too much, but also can't produce any more gas than is absolutely necessary. The solution we found was to use quartz sand mixed into the thermite. When you add the right amount, it still burns really well, but it doesn't spray stuff everywhere. While the silica can burn in the reaction, any that doesn't just melts and acts as a sticky glue to hold the burning mass together. To figure out the right amount, we tested three different concentrations of silica. At 20%, it still burns pretty violently. It doesn't quite go whoosh as much or throw as much debris, but it is not a slow burn by any measure. In the tube test, this mixture did look promising as it didn't just eject all the material, but the flame coming out the top was still pretty large and sparky. And we learned that even though it is more tame, it's not nearly tame enough. Sometimes it would still just melt the copper. Though molten copper does heat the water pretty effectively, so that's kind of progress. At 40%, the mixture burns much more slowly and maintains a steady burn for a few seconds. This is the exact behavior we're looking for. And in the tube test, again, it burns nice and evenly, and you can see that it does a great job of imparting its energy into the water, making it boil steadily. At 60%, things get a bit iffy. The mix burns even more slowly, but we started running into issues of the mix not burning properly or failing to ignite, which is really bad. The only thing more dangerous than an armed incendiary device is one triggered that didn't activate. At this point, we were feeling really confident about this project because we had a mix that heated the water and was pretty controllable. That is, until we tried to light the thermite without using either a sparkler or magnesium ribbon. You see that one of the issues with thermite is that its ignition temperature is hotter than most fire burns. Once it gets going, it burns like a hot dam, but if I literally just point a blowtorch at a pile of thermite, it usually won't go. Fire just isn't hot enough, and apparently the little plasma lighters you can buy aren't either. This kicked off another solid two weeks of tinkering, trying to make a mixture that was both sensitive enough to be lit by an electric igniter, stable enough to not be dangerous to be around, and burns hot enough to start the thermite. Oh, and of course, produce as little gas as physically possible. Unfortunately, because I don't want the bomb squad at my lab for the third time, I can't actually tell you what we settled on for the fuse material, but I will say that I have never had such a difficult time getting things to burn in my life. Which, to be fair, is why some places will sell pre-mixed thermite. It's essentially just inert rust unless you can get it above 1600 degrees, and evidently a spark has to be pretty hot to set it off. The fuse material was mounted to the igniter, and then we used some tissue paper to make a tube around the fuse that we could fill with thermite to make sure it's in good contact. This can then be stuck into the thermite charge to get it to light consistently. Okay, we've got the hot stuff mostly under control now, time to actually build the cooker. The design is pretty simple. It's basically three sections, the cooking area, the thermite canister, and an igniter on the side. The main chamber is heat sealed shut and holds both the water and hot dog ready to be used. The thermite chamber is designed to come apart because we did intend these to be recommissionable, even if that didn't end up being the case. In terms of machining, we really only had to make two parts, both out of aluminum. The first has a lip for the polycarbonate tube to be glued onto. Then the part was drilled and bored out. 
first to the inner diameter of the copper tubing we're using, and then an inner lip was added for the copper tube to sit on. After those features had been turned on the lathe, it was cleaned up and then brought over to the mill to form the vent hole on the side. The other aluminum piece is a plug to fit into the bottom. It has an o-ring groove cut into it so that any gases are forced to go out the vent and can't escape through the bottom. Also, to prevent it popping off like a champagne cork, we drilled and threaded holes both into it and the top piece so they could be bolted together. We also drilled a pair of holes for the igniter wires. Now, we need to join the aluminum piece to the copper tubing, but before we do that, each of the copper pieces were electroplated in bright nickel. This is to prevent the copper leaching into the water and the hot dog, and also just because we're super extra and thought it would look pretty. So I spent hours carefully polishing each of the tubes to prepare them for plating. Oh, and as you saw in the intro, we made a bunch of these things, so this process was repeated many times. In terms of plating, we whipped up a super fast, bright nickel plating bath. The ingredients are 25 grams of nickel sulfate, a teaspoon of salt, a sprinkle of either ascorbic or citric acid, and then a tiny bit of a surfactant. Here I'm using tween 20, but a tiny drop of dish soap will likely work as well. We're not going for suds or foaming, we just need a little bit to break the surface tension. As you can tell by how I gave these measurements, the exact quantities of most of the ingredients don't matter. For the plating, I'm using a nickel electrode connected to the positive lead of my bench power supply, and the tube I connect to the negative. Ignore the color of the wires here, they're backwards. No matter how many times I've done this, I always get anode and cathode backwards, because chemists and physicists go by opposite names and can't agree. I've set the supply to 8 volts and about 1 amp max. Rather than leaving the tube in the solution, I kept it constantly moving and would periodically rotate it to try and get a nice even coating. If a blemish developed that looked darker and not shiny, I'd clean off the piece, then pop it back on the lathe for a quick polish touch-up, followed by a few more dunks in the plating bath. With that done, we could join the copper tube to the machined aluminum parts, but we can't use epoxy here because this metal will be exposed directly to the thermite. The last thing we want is water leaking onto the burning thermite, so we picked up this special solder specifically made to join aluminum and copper. Though I will say this stuff is not easy to work with. You have to get both pieces incredibly hot and leaving enough gap for the solder to kind of drip into a little bit as it doesn't wick very well. But after a few failed attempts, we learned how to get it to make a nice, tight, strong join. Unfortunately, that joint looks like crap, so I carefully trimmed off the excess metal on the lathe. With that done, everything was again polished and then popped back into the plating bath just to tidy things up and to make sure that this weird solder is fully covered with a food-safe metal. At this point, the cookers are mostly done, and there's only a few things left to do. The first is to epoxy on the polycarbonate tube and the igniters. Then we 3D printed a few pieces to make it all sit together nicely, and a safety cover to make sure that they cannot be set off by accident. Then we of course need to load the tube with its hot dog and enough water to cover it. We heat sealed the tube closed with a removable lid and popped a safety cap on top so the seal doesn't get damaged. Though we did learn it is excruciatingly important to remove the heat seal before setting off the device. Oh. Fire extinguisher, fire extinguisher, fire extinguisher, right now. Oh. Fire extinguisher, fire extinguisher, fire extinguisher, right now. Finally, the tubes need to be armed. We're using a 15 gram charge of our special thermite here, which we tamp into the end of the tube gently before adding the igniter and packing the rest of the tube with kaowol. This will help contain the reaction so the thermite doesn't get sprayed out of the vent while still allowing gas to escape. After that, everything is closed up and the cooker is ready for use. All right, I'm hungry and was promised a hot dog, so let's get cooking. For our final version, we also added a removable base to prevent the thing tipping over. But when everything was set and we pushed the button, the result was magical. Smoke. Yeah, there we go.
And finally, I give you what may be the best piece of thermal camera footage ever recorded. You can actually see the silhouette of the hot dog as the water starts to heat up, but by the time it's done cooking and we pull it out at the end, it is a perfectly cooked hot dog, cooked through and ready to eat. I've been making videos on this platform since 2011, and it has changed a lot in that time. By far the biggest change is the ever-encroaching horde of ads that fill videos, ours included, and the need to please an ever-changing swamp of requirements not to spook those advertisers. For example, our last video about Egyptian mummification was a nine-month-long research project, packed to the brim with art and archaeology, but was deemed unfit for advertising. And this video is a coin toss, honestly. Imagine if all of your favorite creators came together to build a place where we could make and share the content that we know you'll love without having to worry about advertisers. A place where we're not forced to make content that's more about hitting the trending tab than being a good video. Well, thankfully, that already exists, and it's called Nebula. Nebula is the amazing creator-owned streaming platform where we're joined by amazing creators like Practical Engineering, Nile Red, Strange Parts, Breaking Taps, and so many more. And not only are the videos completely ad-free, there is a ton of bonus content there too. The mummification video I mentioned actually came with a bonus 25 minute long piece on Nebula where we went into even more detail on our process, and things like the translation of all the hieroglyphs. And beyond those Nebula exclusives, there's also Nebula Originals, like Real Science's Becoming Human series. So if that sounds good, then use the link below to get a year's subscription for the incredibly low price of only $30, or just about $2.50 per month. I can't think of any other streaming platform that is as good value for the price. So head over to nebula.tv slash the Thought Emporium to sign up today and upgrade your viewing experience. That's all for now, and we'll see you next time. Ha, ha, ha.